Hello, good morning. Um, welcome and good afternoon to our colleagues in Europe and a good evening to colleagues in Asia. And welcome again to this World River and Delta Source to Think webinar series. And today is the Source to Think uh, 21-04. This is number four of uh, this semester. So today uh, we invite Professor Richard uh, to uh, Stussy Sigi uh, from uh, Adam uh, McCreary's University in Poland. And he will talk about the source to think in high latitude. And in the past uh, last year and earlier, even this year, we have talks talk about Amazon, we talk about Mississippi River, Mekong, Irrawaddy, the Nile River, Yangtze, and uh, Indus River and many uh, tropical river, many uh, low latitude river. So we have only very few talks talk about high latitude. So particularly the fluid uh, in the glacial environment. So, uh, so today we are very happy to get uh, Richard to talk about this the sediment and organic carbon in fluid of uh, Slava uh, bird. So before I introduce him, I would like also mentioned that last year we have 35 uh, webinars have uh, received, have an archive stored on the YouTube channel. So if you want to check, just go to the, the YouTube and it's tinyurl.com S2S talks. And oh, if you're in China, you cannot access the YouTube, you can go to the B station. And so uh, also I want to see this Coming Friday, uh, we have another fantastic direct talk by Charlie Paul, and uh, he will talk about the, how to track the sediment, particularly the sand part in Mount Ruby Canyon, mainly the uh, uh, 30 years of the vision. So uh, please mark your calendar at the same time this Friday and uh, 9 a.m. in Easter Coast. So, uh, um, Professor um, Stu, uh, Stusinski uh, is uh, from Poland, is the University of Bonn, and he, from his CV, as you can see, he's a very uh, active internationally. Uh, his PhD, he studied in Vietnam, and I began to know him when we were working together on the Mekong River Delta uh, project. And he also now have uh, some project in Thailand, like the geohazard, and uh, also uh, uh, working Antarctic, uh, focus on the sediment, uh, transport sediment record, and also organ the feet of uh, organic, the flux and feet of the organic project. So uh, I think uh, uh, we are just uh, uh, cannot wait to hear what he will give a talk to us. So, uh, Rita, please uh, stop sharing. Please go ahead, share your screen and put a pre presentation mode. So, good afternoon, but also good morning and, and, uh, and good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, invitation and for presentation. Uh, and I'm really a big fan of this Source to Think series, and uh, I'm very glad that I have also opportunity to, uh, to share some data and some insights with you. Uh, I used to work, as uh, Paul mentioned, in, in various uh, sedimentary environments, uh, because processes in principle are, are, uh, are the same, the magnitude may, may, may differ. So I started my career simultaneously working in Svalbard and uh, as well as in the South China Sea. Then I moved uh, a little bit more into uh, to work into catastrophic processes like tsunami storms and, uh, and so on. However, I still conduct uh, some research in Svalbard area and uh, um, I used to work there for almost uh, 13 uh, summer seasons, but I visited it also during, during winter seasons. And I had a great opportunity to uh, work uh, not only on offshore, but also onshore. So from 
source to sink perspective, uh, it, is, it is very helpful. Um, of course, as it used to be, you know, marine geological work and in particular in polar regions, it's not uh, uh, a single person work, it's always a team effort. And uh, I am very glad that I had opportunity to meet fantastic friends and collaborators. Many of them contributed to the material I'm going to present to you today, uh, including my former and present uh, PhD students. Uh, the list is, of course, not complete, but uh, I really hope that all of them will, um, uh, will be happy to be, to be mentioned, at least in this way. Uh, as uh, Paul uh, mentioned before, this is not the first, uh, um, the, the, the whole series is mostly about tropical and low latitudes uh, uh, source to sink systems, but it's not the first one. So I will refer a little bit to the previous uh, talk by Elena Overlem about the Greenland's sediment flux. And because I uh, used uh, also radiochemistry in particular at 210 and cesium, I will not ex explain again some, some basic of, of them uh, Dave uh, DeMaster made a, a great talk already uh, a couple of weeks ago. You may find both presentations uh, online on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, so first of all, for uh, those of you who are not familiar with the region, where is the Svalbard? Svalbard is right here. So we are really uh, high in the really high latitudes, reaching 80 degrees north. Uh, you may see that uh, it is just next to the northern reaches on, on Greenland. However, Svalbard and Greenland are quite different from each other, uh, mainly because um, and they are uh, 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 next to different oceanic currents. Uh, the specific uh, side of Svalbard is due to uh, the thermocaline in circulation, the North Atlantic current, Norwegian Atlantic current, and then West Spitsbergen current carries heat, carries saline waters to the northern latitudes and makes Svalbard particularly warm, taking into account the high latitudes. This uh, warming of a Svalbard area is particularly uh, clear if we take into account and the temperature record from the last decades, as you may see that Arctic is warming more than double than the global average. And uh, it's partly also, it includes also Svalbard. Uh, so although it is so far away and although it is not inhabited by many persons, uh, the permanent occupations like uh, 1,000 to a couple of thousands persons in, in Svalbard area, it is very important for us to study this region because of this thermocaline circulation and because it is a kind of acid test for us for climate change. So the climate change is much better, the effects of this are much better visible in these high latitudes areas. Svalbard is an archipelago. It consists of a number of islands with the biggest one called Spitsbergen. And uh, I will focus here on a number of fjord systems. The biggest is East Fjorden with several branches uh, called Bile Fjord and Advent Fjord, and these two I will mention later on. Uh, the best studied fjords are Kongsfjorden and Hornsund. Uh, next to them are several um, scientific uh, stations, which are a really good base. Uh, and make a Svalbard and fjords of Svalbard a kind of natural laboratory. Uh, from the point of view uh, of uh, why we are so much interested in it, I would like to mention also a location near to the polar front as the eastern part is uh, <coughs> swathed by East Spitsbergen current carrying cold Arctic waters while along the western coast we got warmer Atlantic waters. It, the sea ice edge uh, the, is usually also just next to Spitsbergen Island. And the fjords are uh, in kind of transitional state. So because of the glacial recessions, they come from 
tidewater glaciers and tidewater glacier dominated into the fjords, which are fed by rivers and mountwater rivers coming from the glaciers more inland. And the glaciers are one of the key topics of my talk as well, because they influence the system a lot. Uh, one of the reasons is that they are subjected to ret significant retreat. It's one of the glaciers, Hansbrenn, here in the 50s and here at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it is just next to the Polish Polar Station in the Hornsund, so that side which is uh, quite frequently visited and monitored. Also part of the results I'm going to, to show you are from this place. And, and the recession of the glaciers caused a major shifts in uh, environmental stresses in the fjords, so it affects not only sedimentation, but uh, not only oceanography, but also major uh, biological changes. Uh, what I am going to talk during the next uh, half an hour or so. Uh, first of all, I would like shortly present you fjords of Spitsbergen in context of source to sink concept. It's not so commonly used in terms of high latitudes, but in the context of the whole series, I hope it will be useful. Uh, then I'm going to give you an example of dominating sedimentary processes uh, in, the, in the fjords and uh, sediment accumulation rates, because the knowledge about fjords in general is already uh, huge. However, some specific ideas, some specific data, in particular of the quantitative data, are still missing. And uh, it is also a part which I'm going to enhance here that the accumulation rates and uh, sediment fluxes, uh, first of all, we do not know them as precisely as we would like to know them. Secondly, they are going to change along with climate change. And uh, finally, because uh, uh, organic carbon is in, in kind of hot topic in the last uh, decades, also in context of, of fjords, uh, I would like to provide you a kind of interesting uh, insights uh, from our recent most uh, studies, which may be of interest, at least for, for some of you. Uh, so I will try to keep this talk uh, relatively general, so it, to make it uh, uh, interesting for those of you who are not familiar with, with the topic. However, uh, those who are experts, I hope they will find also some brand new results, which may be of interest also for them. Well, Starting from source to sink in polar regions, in some cases, uh, this source to sink uh, system, which we know, for instance, from big Asian rivers to be several thousands of kilometers long, in case of uh, Svalbard fjords and other fjords, sometimes maybe pretty short, as we got simply the outflow from the tidewater glacier and fast deposition in the fjord. Uh, and in the case of Svalbard, we have two dominating cases. Uh, one is a kind of meltwater river dominated system. It's in case where we got glaciers, which are land-based, far on land, and uh, the meltwater is flowing down, uh, reaching the fjord in, a, uh, in the fjord, forming fjord head deltas. Uh, because we are in the tidal regime, uh, the fjords are often uh, affected by tidal amplitude of approximately 1 to 1.5 meters. It's not high, but it's enough to produce relatively large uh, tidal flats. And this kind of uh, system fits some of the major uh, valleys already during the Holocene. And, uh, most of what we know about the system, we know, in fact, from this Holocene record, because modern studies, at least about focus on sedimentary processes, are not very extensive in this respect. We know something about interdidal zone. There are some studies on the uh, forests, on the delta slopes, including some uh, one of the first studies using uh, side scan sonar. Uh, which was used in Advent Dahlen by Pr David Pryor 
uh, and, and co-authors. Uh, and uh, we know that there, there are some kind of turbidity currents, but we have mostly indirect evidence. And it's from this point of view, it's uh, relatively poorly studied system because most of the studies focuses on sedimentation from suspended sediment plume. The second uh, system is a case where tidewater glaciers, granted glaciers, uh, flow down to, toward the fjord and sediment, mostly in form of transport by subglacial meltwater uh, conduits, uh, is, is <coughs> supplied directly to the, to the fjord. Uh, here you can see one of the examples is Hans Bren. Uh, I will uh, talk about it later on as, uh, as well. Uh, and uh, uh, in principle, although there are some uh, processes related to ice cliff contact, uh, th there may be some small uh, deltas produced in, in front of it. Uh, majority of the sediment, as well as majority of studies are related to the deposition from the meltwater plume uh, delivered uh, by meltwaters from uh, from subglacial subglacial conduits. Well, both systems have some similarities and some dissimilarities. Let me show you an example from uh, two bays which are just next to each other: Petunia Bukta and Adolf Bukta in the central part of Spitsbergen. Uh, the, on one hand, we got several rivers meeting together on a uh, on a tidal flat and supplying the sediment to the uh, fjordhead delta. On the other hand, we've got a tidewater glacier with a one major subglacial outflow. You can you can trace this plume from 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 this outflow. And um, already a couple of years ago, we investigated it in terms of suspended particulate matter or suspended sediment, if you prefer, and uh, how does it change with the seasons in front of a, a delta and in front of a tidewater glacier. And you may see uh, the summer situation and we got in front of a glacier relatively thick, up to 10 meters thick brackish layer of water, uh, which is enriched in suspended sediment, which is transported far away from the glacier. On the other hand, in the case of uh, uh, river delta, uh, there is also a kind of uh, plume and enrichment in suspended sediment in the near surface waters. However, most of the sediment is transported along the delta slope uh, and, uh, and uh, we have a maximum of uh, suspended particulate matter nearby the baton. But in fall, uh, the system is uh, switched off in case of the rivers on land. They are simply frozen. However, tidewater glaciers still provide some sediment and melt water uh, towards the, uh, the nearby bay. So you may still see some uh, enhanced suspended sediment in the near, near surface waters. Uh, how does it translate into particulate matter fluxes, which we measured with sediment traps? Here you got uh, examples with sediment traps uh, experiments during summer, here during autumn. You may see that these values are very, very low. Uh, and um, what you can see in summer that in front of a tidal thread, flat, in front of a uh, river delta, the suspended uh, the particulate matter fluxes are pretty high, but just in hundreds of meters from, from the tidal flat edge. Uh, here is the distance in, in, in the kilometers. In case of tidewater glacier, the, the deposition from suspended uh, sediment, uh, from, uh, from suspension is in still high, even a couple of kilometers from the source. The sediments in all the cases are poorly sorted, which, is, uh, which also explains the mechanism and fast deposition as the deposition takes place uh, is uh, and strongly enhanced by flocculation. It is particularly important in case of tidal flood because the sediment supplied with the rivers 
is sufficient is mixed with marine waters already on tidal flat, and most of that is deposited really rapidly uh, along the uh, delta slope or just in front of of the delta. Uh, if we compare the results from Advent Fjord and, and Petunia Bukta, there are two bays with uh, fjord head deltas and Kongsfjord and, and Adolf Bukta, two cases with uh, tidewater glaciers. We may see that with a distance from the major sediment source, of course, the particulate matter fluxes decrease rapidly, and note the logarithmic scale. Uh, however, there is uh, a kind of change between the systems. So in front of the uh, deltas, the accumulation, the, the deposition takes place really rapidly. So within the first few hundred meters, most of the suspended sediment is deposited uh, on the seafloor, while in case of uh, tidewater glaciers, the um, sediment is dispersed over larger areas in terms at least of a couple of kilometers. What I showed you, it was mostly related to the summer season, plus a couple of experiments during early autumn. Uh, we always wondered what may happen during the remaining seasons like uh, spring or winter. Is it really just frozen system or and nothing happened or is it still active? Uh, during the air temperatures for most of the year are below zero and uh, and during the winter time, we have several months even without light. So these are factors you should take into account. Part of a fjord may be also frozen by fast with presence of fast ice. Everything may affect in somehow also the, the accumulation in the, the sedimentation in the fjord. Uh, here is an example of Hans Brenn uh, and you may see the, the bay and the number of stations which were investigated uh, for more than one year every month. It's, uh, it was possible because there is a Polish polar station just uh, nearby, which is active for for whole year. And uh, first of all, uh, it's kind of uh, interesting to point the circulation in, in front of such a in front of such a glacial. As uh, usually the common uh, understanding is that there is a surface brackish water plume which is flowing pretty fast along the surface and there must be some compensation underflow. Uh, here you may see ADCP transects which are perpendicular to the glacier front. So um, let me come back. Uh, so it's along this line. And uh, you may see already from the flow direction that uh, the flow direction along the surface is quite different from the flow direction below. Uh, the flow velocities are also uh, kind of remarkable along the, the seafloor. There is a kind of seal closing the bay in the front of a glacier. And we got um, quite a lot of uh, suspended sediment in the, in the water column as we can see from acoustic intensity. However, even more interesting is if we have a look into uh, transect parallel to the glacial front, as we may see in particular in the flow velocity, uh, two maxima, one near the surface close to the subglacial outflow, and the second one deeper in the water depth of approximately 40 meters, which is pumping water, uh, which is the way where water is pumped from the open fjord towards the the, the ice front. So it is the record of this exchange. Uh, on one hand, we got the, the water flowing out from the glacier nearby the surface. On the other hand, we got the water pumped toward the glacier, uh, which is later on upwelled along the, the ice cliff. It's maybe important, for instance, in the context which we are going to discuss later of supply of organic matter of marine origin in the in glacial proximal settings. And if we have a look into seasonal changes in suspended particulate matter, uh, we got the 
ice cliff on the left hand side, uh, open open fjord on the right hand side, and we got uh, several cases from springtime. So we go to April and May scenarios, and you may see that uh, in case of fast ice, we got almost no suspended sediment. Uh, then uh, there are periods when we got quite a lot of particulate organic matter in the water column. It is uh, so-called spring bloom. So the period of time when we got enough light for the algae, um, mostly diatoms, already to start uh, the primary production. But on the other hand, there is no much supply from the, from the tidewater glacier, so there is not much mineral matter supplied which cause uh, which would cause uh, turbidity so the light may may be uh, delivered to, to the also to the deeper water uh, and it is a common scenario for the spring in the summer situation is changed completely so particulate organic matter is not so important component of uh, suspended particulate matter but of course it is dominated by uh, inorganic matter. And uh, it's not sur surprising to see a maximum nearby the surface in a brackish uh, surface uh, layer of, uh, of water. Uh, and it is something we would expect. However, in autumn, the situation is quite surprising. As if we would say, if we calculate the total suspended particulate matter in the water column, it appears but it's even bigger than in summer. How it's possible? In summer, there is a fast deposition because of a presence of fresh water and saline water, so the flocculation is enhanced. Uh, where, so where is the suspended particulate matter coming from during the autumn time? It's a time when we got uh, strong uh, storms, we got waves, we got tidal currents, uh, which are uh, which cross the the seal at the entrance to, to, to the bay next to, next to the glacier, and we got a lot of resuspension of the sediment. The sediment is resuspended, but the flocculation is not so active, so the residence time of a suspended sediment is much longer in the water column. And it's one of the reasons why we got the suspended sediment concentrations in the autumn period even bigger than uh, during the summer. Well, uh, I mentioned mostly uh, the processes related to uh, suspended uh, sediment and deposition from suspension. But of course, in fjords, we got also processes related to ice rafting uh, by icebergs, uh, by uh, <coughs> in coastal ice here is on a tidal flat, uh, but also by algae in, in some cases. So we, we may have a a short distance transport by algae, also by so some bigger stones may be, may be transported in this way. However, in quantitative terms, at least in Svalbard, this process is uh, let's say marginal. So it's in a, in a range of in, in the range of uh, error. Well, I'm going to present you what we know about the modern sediment accumulation rate in fjords of Svalbard. Uh, there are several lines of evidence. Uh, on one hand, we have a sediment traps experiment, and I already showed you a couple of examples, but uh, usually they are just for single site. Uh, they do not tell us really ac about accumulation rate, it's about the deposition rate. And uh, it's uh, hard to have such a great amount of data to make re real comparison uh, for, for the fjord system. On the other hand, we've got a commonly used method, so seismics. And seismic data are very useful, for instance, in Alaska, where we got even higher accumulation rate. Uh, but uh, uh, in Svalbard, the accumulation rates are, let's say, moderate. Uh, so the resolution of a seismic is not good enough in many cases. Uh, so we got some data, but for long term, like for the, the Holocene or um, for the deglaciation period. If you would like to focus on the last several, let's say, tens of years to know about the modern accumulation rate, 
then it is not really useful. We may have, uh, we may use, for instance, some laminations in the sediments, but again, and they may be preserved just only in some in some settings, and uh, we are not sure we, if they are annual if we do not have alternative sources of information. Uh, in some fjords, it is possible to analyze uh, specific data on bathymetric change, in particular in front of some tidewater glaciers, but. I would say only in front of Tidewater glaciers, we got reliable data on bathymetrical change. Again, because accumulation rates uh, mostly are in order of millimeters per year. Uh, so it's really hard to, uh, to capture this using this method. Dating with C14 may be very useful, but we have a limited number of sites with sediment cores, which are dated with uh, C14 as usually there are sites which are used for uh, paleoceanographic analysis. And it is a, a bit of problem to compare them because we got various timescales in each time. So to have a kind of comparable data set, uh, the best and uh, uh, source of, of information which I use in this presentation uh, is dating with uh, short-lived radionuclides led to 110 and cesium 137 which covers more or less the same time period in a time frame and uh, it is also supplemented with uh, sedim sediment recovery from recently deglaciated areas because many of the fjords are just in process of formation and the turn of the 20 uh, at the end of the 19th century little ice age has ended in Svalbard since that time, most of the glaciers are rapidly receding, leaving a glacial teal, which is covered by new sediments. And if we are able to uh, take sediment cores like gravity cores, which are just collecting the complete sedimentary cover above a glacial teal, then we have also a kind of approximation, at least, of sediment accumulation rate for the last decades. <clears throat> the mentioned uh, sediment re is a glacial recession produce as, and produce new fjords, new bays, uh, new seascape. Here you may see a, a picture from 1936 uh, showing the area which is currently Breppel and the innermost part of a Hornsund. You may still see a lot of uh, uh, seafloor fruit features, lineations, recessional moraines, and so on. Uh, you can see, till, see them because the accumulation rate is not high enough to blanket them, but partly it is because the recession rate is so high. It's uh, in some case of some of the glaciers, it's an order of 100, 120 meters per year or even more. So the sediment source is moving continuously backward. And uh, also the, our sediment sink is, uh, is changing in this way. Uh, for comparison, I show you one of the sediment cores from uh, taken from the place where the arrow is. And you may see an example of a sediment core, which is almost two meters long. Uh, it was taken from the place which was deglaciated at, uh, at least in the 1930. So it should contain sediments not older than 90, 90 years. And as you can see, combination of lead 210 dating and cesium uh, provides relatively good estimate of sediment accumulation rate. The advantage of this approach is that we may also trace changes in sediment accumulation rate, which are quite obvious. At the, uh, in the 50s, uh, this site was relatively close to the tidewater glacier front, so the uh, sediment accumulation rate had to be higher while with a continuous retreat, the accumulation rate is getting lower because sediment source is farther away. So I've compiled over, I hope over existing data about short-lived radionuclides uh, in, the, in the fjords and in Svalbard and, and in, in the nearby areas. Uh, so the method was first used in the uh, 1990s and uh, 
already we got some 40 set, um, uh, <coughs> almost 40 sediment cores dated by 210. Uh, and by the end of the last year, we got already over 100 uh, sites dated using this method. And I will provide you today some extra 60 sites uh, with uh, unpublished data. So we got quite, quite a lot of data covering more or less the same time period. And of course, there are some uh, mistakes and calculations. Sometimes uh, it's only LED 210 or only cesium used. Uh, the purposes of various studies were uh, quite variable. Uh, mostly be, uh, there were studies related to some contamination studies uh, um, or with some paleoceanographical studies. So because of a purpose, uh, the, the quality also of the data is, uh, uh, is variable. Uh, so let's have a look uh, on four fjords, which are the best studied so far. One of them is Kongsfjorden. Kongsfjorden is a fjord which is supplied with sediments from several uh, large tidewater glaciers. As you may see, we got altogether 27 cores which were dated uh, so far from this, from this region. And uh, uh, if we have a look on the sediment accumulation rate which are provided, you may see that uh, we got a decrease in sediment accumulation rate with a distance from the fjord head, which is quite kind of obvious and expected. But in principle, the sediment accumulation rates are not very high. They are in order of one to four, five millimeters per year, except some sites which are closer to the, to, to the, uh, to the glacier front. And here I need to, to make a, um, an important note. In many cases, because uh, the sediment cores were taken, for instance, with multi-core or box core, many of them are relatively short. And for that reason, if in the proximal sites, we often have only minimum accumulation rate. So you may see here minimum sediment accumulation rate. Why? Because it was quite often that uh, the authors documented excess lead 210, uh, which was delivered in non-steady uh, non way, which was present throughout the core, but uh, the accumulation rate was high enough, uh, that it, so high that it didn't allow to uh, calculate uh, sediment accumulation rate using the standard models. And there are some exceptions. For instance, the core, which is marked here, providing accumulation rate with 80, meters, uh, 80 millimeters per year. Uh, so we took two sediment cores, uh, not just close to the glacier front. It was uh, uh, some distance away, several kilometers away. And, uh, but the sediment cores were not taken with a, a box core, but with a gravity core. So they are several meters long. And as you may see, uh, the excess lead 210 is present at least uh, down to 100, uh, more than one meter deep. And we, may, we see also the signal from cesium. So it is certainly not perfect profile to calculate sediment accumulation rate. And certainly it is non-steady accumulation, but in combination with the presence of cesium, it's enough to provide us with a kind of estimate of at least minimum estimate of sediment accumulation rate. So what I would say is that the low, low minimum sediment accumulation rates, which are reported from many proximal sites are just because the sediment cores are too short or and there is uh, not uh, correct method used. Well, let me provide you another example from Advent Fjorden. It's a, a bay which is supplied with a river just next to Long Urbien, the major settlements in, 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 in Svalbard. Here we dated uh, uh, already in 2004 several cores, um, and uh, they provide us also with relatively small sediment accumulation rate over 
I would like to mention a relatively high, even in comparison to, 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 to other sites. And we got some sites with uh, accumulation rate like 20 millimeters per, almost 20 millimeters per year. However, please note that the sediment cores were not taken from the Delta front. So in fact, the major sediment sink is missing. And interesting point to make here is that uh, in, in this work, we found that sediment accumulation rate tends to increase with time. Uh, I will mention the reasons for that in, 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 in a couple of slides. So please remember that here we really missed this proximal part. You may remember from our examples with sediment, with sediment traps one kilometer from the, from the river mouth. It's the maximum zone of deposition in case of river fed uh, uh, fjord head deltas. Ville Fjorden, it's a fjord which I showed you already before in examples, as here is Petunia Bukta and Adolf Bukta. So it is the study site for the sediment traps study. And we got several uh, uh, older sediment cores already dated, and uh, I would like to show you some new data from a tidal flood. So from the top set in terms of uh, uh, of a river uh, uh, river delta, and uh, as you may see, the sediment accumulation rate in the fjord is in order of one to two millimeters per year. So it's not very high, although it is supplied with uh, meltwater from number of glaciers around. Uh, on the top set. Of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, on the tidal flat, the accumulation rate is uh, already much higher uh, in terms of uh, one centimeter per year even or more. However, it's still not very high. So where is the sediment from, from the river, from the rivers coming to? Here we got one point, one data point, which was taken on the, uh, on the delta slope. However, it's just a minimum accumulation rate because the the core was not very long and we found excess led to 110 throughout. So just assuming that it must be younger than 100 years, but that's all we can say. So it can be two millimeters per year, but it could be 20 centimeters per, per year as well. So as you may see, it's really a missing point in, 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 a, in a missing area, missing in, in, our, in our knowledge. And the Biele Fjord and the central part uh, was uh, subjected earlier uh, in a, in a lo longer term studies, which are presented uh, already some 10 years ago, uh, where uh, we combined a number of C14 datings, uh, lead 200 datings, cesium, and so on. And uh, we found out that there is a, a kind of rapid change in sediment accumulation rate. So during the Little Ice Age, sediment accumulation rate was almost an, an order of magnitude lower than after during the 20th century. Why? The explanation seems to be relatively easy. We got a glacial recession after Little Ice Age, which means we've got a negative mass balance. Negative mass balance means that we got precipitation plus water from the glacial system. So some ex extra water for transport. Then the receding glaciers leave in front of them a lot of sediments, which is just ready to go. So it's a kind of sedimentary, it's, it's a, <clears throat> it is a kind of temporary storage, which is just ready for, for transport to, to the fjord. Uh, I would mention also the decreasing permafrost, but it's not so important in this case. So these two factors seem to be the, more, the most important. And similar pattern we observed also in other fjords. Uh, although the data are not good enough sometimes to, to really prove it that it, it, it really took place. Well, let me jump to the best studied fjord so far in terms of sediment accumulation rate, Hornsund. Uh, we got uh, from this fjord, which is, as you may see, just about 30 kilometers long, we got almost 80 cores uh, collected uh, and analyzed uh, by me and my team colleagues and as well as by the other authors 
in the previous decades and uh, recently uh, because there is a large gap in the uh, in the new base which were formed after Little Ice Age, you may see that at the end of the Little Ice Age, so 1900, all of these bays were covered by, by glaciers. Uh, so we added some 50 new sediment cores and, and box cores from this inner part uh, to provide a kind of comprehensive assessment, at least we hope so. So, uh, if we focus on the data which were published before and which were almost exclusively from the central and outer part of the fjord, we got the accumulation rate, uh, rates similar as were reported from the other fjords. So in order of one to five millimeters per year, in some cases, a little bit higher. But again, if we got just a single data point in order of 40 millimeters per year, it, uh, it may be a specific, uh, very specific site, kind of sediment sink, trapping effect or whatever. However, when we add the new data to this data set, then uh, first of all, we change the scale. And uh, the 40 millimeters per, per year is right here. We got a number of sites with accumulation rate, which is much, much higher in order of several tens of centimeters per year. Uh, and of course, most of that is in the innermore part, in part of, of the fjord. There are still some point data points with low accumulation rate, but as, as I mentioned, it is a minimum accumulation rate. So if we found a, a box core or sediment core with a excess led to 110 activity throughout, we just could assume that it must be younger than uh, uh, let's say 100 years, or if we know the retreat date of a particular sediment core site, then we may try to recalculate it. Uh, it is confirmed also by other evidences. So, for instance, one of the fjords, um, one of the glaciers right here, Hansbrand, uh, which I presented data about suspended particulate matter before. Uh, we have an exact knowledge about retreat uh, positions of this glacier, and we know also details about bathymetry and some uh, seismic data. And there are several basins which are filled with the sediment, and from the thickness of the sediments, it seems that accumulation rate in the order of 25 to 40 centimeters a year and this proximal basins is something which is really likely. So it is in accordance with the data we got from, from other sources. And so if we would like to combine everything together, here you got the data from almost 200 data points all over the Svalbard. It's quite clear that if we focus on central and outer part of the fjords, we talk about um, accumulation rates, which are in order of few millimeters per year. However, what we miss and what we know from the ex experiments with sediment traps, as well as from the datings of new cores from the proximal sites, most of the deposition and most of the accumulation takes place, of course, obviously, within the first few kilometers from the glacier fronts. And it is a setting which is really missed in, in many previous studies and assessment of uh, accumulation rates. Although it is a kind of common knowledge, we know of course that the highest accumulation rates must be there. It has uh, certainly implications for other kind of calculations of uh, sediment budgets, but also of organic carbon accumulation rates. I will come back to that. So using very conservative uh, approach, uh, taking into account the lowest dry bulk density, uh, excluding all the areas which where we were not sure about uh, if there are really depositional areas, and taking into account always the lowermost assessment of sediment accumulation rate, we may take uh, we may distinguish these two zones: the innermost parts of the fjords and the central and outer part of the fjords. And uh, taking the assumptions I told you before into account, we end up with accumulation of around one 
more than 120 tons of sediments in the outer part, which is which was used to be studied before, and in the inner more parts, we got at least an order of magnitude larger number. So it must be at least 200 and 2200 tons uh, of uh, uh, annual accumulation of sediment. So uh, please keep it in mind because in most of the studies so far, which are presented in many papers, uh, the authors focus on sediment cores from the central and outer part of the fjords. And it, is, it seems not to be really representative. Of course, it's just a case of a single fjord, but uh, in, in, in the future, it needs to be, uh, this kind of approach, in my opinion, should be, should be extended. But I'm, I'm sure it's a, a thought to be, to be considered in the future. Well, we discuss about things in, on the fjord bottom, on the fjord floor. However, the, if we talk about source to sink approach, we need also to consider coastal environments and coastal sediments. So uh, again, we are in the, in the Hornsund and you may see a picture from east to the west. So Hornsund is actually here from 1936 and from 2018. And you may see the new base, but also new coasts developed. So you may see here Brepol and the innermost part of a, of, a, of a Hornsund and how the shape of this bay develop over the years. So it's, uh, it is uh, tens of hundreds of kilometers of new coastlines which were produced meanwhile. And these new coastlines are quite variable. It's not just a, a cliff coast or a sandy poor or sediment poor barriers. In some cases, there are pretty large uh, sediment fans, like here you may see a zodiac boat in, in the back uh, for, for scale and, uh, and new tidal flats. And please take into account that some of them, like this one, develop after 1950s. So it's just several decades to produce these this new landforms. And uh, it's it's another of, uh, it's another environment to be taken into account in the future calculations of sediment budgets. Well, uh, I can see uh, Thomas in the audience, and, uh, and so uh, I, I'm sure he he is willing to know uh, what happens with organic carbon in these fjords in case if if, if there is such a high uh, carbon burial rate. Uh, uh, they um, focus attention of many scientists uh, be, uh, uh, by publishing a paper in 2015 um, about the role of carbon in, uh, and the role of fjords and organic carbon burial. The idea which was already uh, somehow discussed before, but uh, it's st it started to be really intensively studied during the last five years. Uh, this uh, uh, assessment which showed that fjords are really important as a places of organic carbon burial was mainly based on a, a kind of global compilation but mainly on temperate fjords and i would say that in that compilation uh, the subpolar and polar fjords uh, with high accumulation sites were somehow underrepresented so for instance for svalbard there were just um, five sediment cores taken uh, for that assessment with um, relatively low sediment accumulation rates. And we know from uh, numerous studies that uh, organic carbon uh, uh, is a relatively com common constituent of Svalbard fjord sediments. So you may see here, for instance, in, in the Hornsund, which is somehow exceptional because uh, usually, as you may see here, most uh, here are data from Kongsfjord, and you may see that with a distance from the glacier, usually uh, organic carbon content increase. Uh, however, in the Hornsund, it is even opposite. Uh, why? Uh, that's uh, another um, uh, another point for discussion. Um, for a number of cores, we also analyzed uh, total organic carbon content, and uh, mm, it is a compilation uh, uh, which was 
the previous year published by Budarska Kowalczuk and uh, all and uh, you may see Arctic fjords with glaciers and they mean mostly here fjords of Svalbard with carbon organic carbon accumulation rate but this assessment is based only on the data from the outer parts of the fjords. If we take the inner parts of the fjords, like in Hornsund, then the conservative assessment provides an, an order of ma magnitude higher organic carbon accumulation rates. And if we take into account fjord, head fjord deltas and ice proximal environments, it must be at least in these environments even higher. And um, well, so that's one point which is important, but uh, then the question is also what kind of organic carbon is really stored in this sediment? Uh, so let me present uh, results for a couple of, uh, of course, uh, mainly from that one, which is taken from the site which was deglaciated in around 1940s. And it is, uh, and these dates are in uh, accordance with our uh, dating of a sediment, uh, both using lead 210 and cesium. And uh, our high accumulation, uh, high resolution analysis provided information about sediment sources, which seems to be more or less stable, relatively high total organic carbon content, reaching up to 2%. So it is something which we usually find in temperate fields. And, uh, but this organic carbon content does not change much. And as, as, as I mentioned before, accumulation rate change. So it means that it's very likely that this organic carbon comes with the sediment. It's not a dilution or uh, otherwise we would have a variability of the organic carbon here uh, if it would be mostly of marine, uh, of marine origin. And uh, also if we take into account uh, other proxies, they provide that this, this carbon is more or less from the same, same source all the time. If we consider stable isotopes, it seems that it is a mixed site where we, we are just somehow in midway between marine and terrestrial environment. And taking into account where actually we are, uh, it's hard to believe that we got really terrestrial carbon delivered to that site. Uh, as we got almost uh, no tundra around, there are only glaciers, right? So it's, it is a point to be taken into account and uh, to say something more about the origin of the carbon. Uh, I use also, uh, I analyze radiocarbon and organic matter in this course. And we may use radiocarbon as uh, the measure of the age, but we may use it also as a measure of modern carbon fraction. So if we assume that we got uh, organic carbon from an ancient source, which is older than 50,000 years old, and some organic carbon, which is fresh, and we mix them, uh, the result will be more or less the same as we date, for instance, 20,000 years old uh, uh, organic tissue. And in fact, that's the case. So here you can see four sediment cores and modern carbon fraction based on radiocarbon uh, dating. So, and it seems if, if I present it in, a, in an age, it will be like 20,000 years old. Uh, in 20,000 years old, it was last glacial maximum and, and we had a, a complete Svalbard and Barents, ice, uh, Barents shelf covered with the ice sheet. Uh, so it's not possible that it is a redeposited organic carbon of that age it shows that it is a pretty old organic carbon from sedimentary rocks in the catchment, which is mixed with a tiny portion of modern carbon. And it is also supported by a slight trend, as you may see that this modern carbon fraction uh, increase in the uppermost parts of the cores. So we got a slightly lower accumulation rate. We are far away from the, from the sediment source. So we may have also a bigger contribution of modern marine carbon. Well, where is this carbon coming from? And why, particularly in Hornsund, we have relatively high uh, total organic carbon content. If we note the uh, geology of Svalbard, then you may see this yellow uh, areas are paleogene and neogene rocks, mostly 
continental shelf deposits. So the deposits where we uh, expect a mixture of terrestrial and marine origin organic carbon. And uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, local setting here is Longyearbyen. And then Longyearbyen, we got coal mines. So we got also coal seams within this kind of rocks. Of course, we have no outcrops here. Everything is covered by glaciers. Uh, so we cannot investigate it in, 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 uh, in details, but it really shows that in particular in glaciated areas, uh, which includes not only Svalbard, but also in Greenland, Antarctica and so on, uh, we need to be really careful in assessment and using the commonly a common proxies for uh, tracing the sources of organic carbon uh, because it may be just inherited uh, from, from ancient sedimentary rocks. So coming to the end and uh, to share with you some uh, take home messages I would like to, uh, you to remember. Mm, I showed many doubts, but nevertheless, the fjords of Svalbard belong to the best studied polar fjords worldwide uh, in terms of a number of studies, in terms of a number of sediment cores uh, dated and so on. However, many questions are still open. Uh, for instance, we miss uh, the information and uh, quantitative data about fjord head deltas. And it is particularly important because fjord head deltas are the future of Svalbard. With a continuous retreat of the glaciers, most of the fjords will be transformed into the fjords which are uh, fed by the rivers meltwater rivers, not by tidewater glaciers. Then the lack of a good data about sediment accumulation rates, although there is a common knowledge that sediment accumulation is much higher in the inner parts of the fjords, makes the so far existing assessment of sediment fluxes as well as carbon burial uh, to be largely underestimated. And uh, the same problems which we have here in terms of source to sink budget, in terms of uh, organic carbon burial and organic carbon budget are going to be expected in all other glaciated fjords from Greenland to, to Antarctica. So, so far, we know we have some footprints. Uh, we know what kind of a processes are really going on here. However, we, we are still far away from uh, correct assessment of the size and magnitude of these processes which are ongoing. Thank you very much for your attention and I would be happy to uh, to answer your questions. Wow, wow, uh, Rita, thank you uh, so much for such a great, great talk. I think we really learned a lot. So we are, again, if you have any question, just uh, go ahead to unmute yourself and uh, so just uh, just ask. Okay, so here we have a, uh, Richard, are you able to open the chat? So here is uh, uh, Yi Yang. Yi Yang, you want to ask, you want to, me ask to, to read a question? Um, I, I, I can just ask the question if you, if you allow me. Yeah, where are you from, um, Yi Yang? Uh, I'm, from, I'm from China. I, I currently study in uh, Boston University. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, my question is on the, on the, on the, on the bare land uh, between the tidal land, between the coastline and the, and the, and the mountain ice head, do you see the river um, forming? And if they are, um, are they more braided rivers or there is always a main stem. Thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, the rivers in, uh, in Svalbard are controlled by a number of factors. Uh, first of all, all of them are seasonal. So although the glaciers are so-called polythermal, so they deliver some water also uh, during winter season, at least some of them, uh, the, the rivers are frozen. Uh, are, for most, most of them are uh, nice examples of braided rivers. 
however, because of uh, tectonic control, because of uh, uh, the shape which is uh, inherited of the valleys after, after the former glaciations, in some cases, uh, um, it's a mixture of bridled river and a river which is well channeled. If we come to the river mouth, then it may be, it may be a little bit surprising and um, as we have no, it's not a typical kind of tidal flat. Uh, we got the river getting into the tidal flat and the, the main channels persist at least for several decades as we compared uh, the satellite images and the aerial photography before. Uh, and they seems to be pretty stable. It's partly because the, the lower courses of the rivers are composed of uh, relatively stiff muddy sediments, uh, which keeps the channel in more or less in the, in the same position. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I have a follow-up question if, uh, if we have time. Um, um, for, the, for the shorelines, you, you mentioned there's a massive amount of uh, new coastlines forming in these uh, environments. So it's actually, so do you think the shoreline is also uh, unique from other parts of the, other parts of the world, uh, warmer uh, environments? Because I think, I think in, in, in other areas, it, there's always a main uh, source of sediments going into um, the river banks or the, the estuary shorelines. But here, as you, as you mentioned, the rivers always, uh, most of the case are braided and uh, it's seasonal. So it's like sediment is coming from all directions. Well, uh, thank you. It's really uh, a really good question. As uh, uh, fjords and fjords of Svalbard in particular, for a pretty long time, are considered to be a kind of natural laboratory. And uh, it is going to, uh, to be also in case of, uh, of these new coastlines. So principal processes shaping the coastlines are more or less the same as you can find worldwide. So uh, the fetch length, uh, the, the wave heights, uh, the tides, the uh, alongshore currents, the sediment supply. And the sediment supply is not only from uh, from the rivers or from the glaciers. Please remember that, that there are a lot of sediments which are left after the, the glaciation. And um, as uh, uh, they were, for instance, left as moraines, and right now uh, they start to be, uh, they are going to be, to be eroded, forming cliffs, as well as serving as a new sources of sediment. So this complete shoreline is in a big imbalance. And uh, um, all of these shorelines which I showed you, uh, they are just going to, the, uh, to reach a new state of equilibrium as the sediment sources, sediment suppliers are changing from year to year. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are several climatic factors changing as well with a re continuous retreat of the glaciers on land, this, uh, uh, meltwater amount is uh, increasing. On the other hand, the permafrost is also decreasing. So the active layer of the permafrost is thicker and thicker and may store more water as, as well on one hand. On the other hand, it uh, provides more sediment which may be easily transported to, towards the coast. A uh, changing of the uh, uh, glacier positions changes also the tidal circulation. So there are many fantastic issues to be considered. Okay. Cool. Uh, so uh, first one, uh, the next one is Dongfeng, then uh, Tom. So Dongfeng, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, uh, oh, Mr. Are you, from, uh, are you from Singapore, right? Yes, I'm from Singapore, yeah. Exactly. I, I'm actually, I'm a PhD student doing uh, doing very similar, but, but yeah, but the method, research method is kind of different. I'm doing the uh, sediment fluxes in the Tibetan plateau, also the cold, very cold environments with glaciers and also permafrost. So my question is about the seasonal dynamics of the suspended sediment. So you say you have two different types of river or, or landscape systems. So what about the season driving forces or the underlying processes of the of the sediment dynamics? So in, in addition, 
specifically in addition to the glacier melt, what about the role of uh, snow melt and the, the precipitation or the rainfall in generating uh, sediment, especially uh, we are talking about the climate change. So the precipitation is also changing. There are more rainfall and less snowfall. What about their impacts? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, in fact, in Svalbard, uh, the precipitation events are important only uh, on single days because most of the precipitation is during winter time in form of snow. And if you take the total precipitation into account, it's almost desert as a total precipitation is in the order of 400 millimeters per year. So it's pretty low. Uh, it's, uh, so is this additional uh, events uh, related to precipitation or, uh, or heavy snowfall, avalanches and so on, is not so important. The driving, the major driving mechanism for the distribution during the summer is the uh, fresh water, so brackish water um, overlying the fjord surface, is, uh, which is then uh, modified by wind, partly by, by tides, uh, and it is a major driving force, at least during the summer season. Okay. Then uh, resuspension is also very important during the following uh, seasons. Okay. Hey, hey, Tom, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Withold, very, very interesting talk. I, I would love to chat with you more. I have so many questions, um, and it's stirred many, many interesting thoughts in my mind. Um, so the one thing I wanted to ask that maybe I missed um, was you had two slides that, and maybe, I, as I say, I may have missed it, but it, it's, they seem um, to be saying two different things. One was in the one slide you showed was that there was an order of magnitude higher amounts of carbon in the near field compared to the outer part, right? And you were saying that that's an important thing that people need to consider with regard to um, when they talk in general about fjord carbon burial or sedimentation. Um, and that needs to be taken into consideration. And then um, it was something like 2000 compared to 100 something in the outer parts. Um, um, in, I believe it was in tons. Yeah, this one, that's one, thank you so much. So there was there's that one, which, which makes total sense. And then when you went to sort of the different types of, uh, of fjords uh, latitudinally in terms of um, where the burial is, this one, thank you. So um, it says only, only, only in outer parts of the fjords. And so isn't that in contrast to the previous one or am I mi missing something? So, uh... Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your opinion, and I also would like uh, would be happy to discuss with you uh, about these results. Here, I show sediment accumulation, right? Oh. that's that's the sediment, and of course, the sediment contains uh, organic uh, carbon as well. Uh, here, uh, it is a comparison which was uh, presented to the previous year, and the data which are here right here are only for the outer parts of the fjord. Here in the top, in the red, I put uh, the new, uh, more or less the range, uh, uh, the range of uh, accumulation uh, rates of organic I carbon, see. if we consider this innermost part. I see, okay, I, I see. That was my misinterpretation, thank you. I, I see, okay, that makes sense to me now. And then just another one, um, and then maybe some other time we'll chat. I don't wanna uh, take up too much time. Uh, it was interesting you mentioned about the carbon uh, uh, sources, some of the carbon uh, coming from coal. And I don't know if you're familiar, there was a study by Kim et al, a, a, a part of a, the Dutch group where they actually used retin, uh, sort of hydrocarbon to sort of track this ancient carbon. Um, and they, they found that it was very, um, very site specific in terms of the distribution. When you start looking for coal inputs in this region around this whole area, it was very, very restricted in terms of where they at least found that biomarker. I don't know if you have any comments on that or how that impacts what you were talking about in terms of the role of coal. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the coal seams 
uh, as we know from the analysis of the uh, geological strata around, uh, they are pretty thin. So I would not focus really on coal itself. It's, and there's a much larger mass of uh, mudstones and sandstones, which are also rich in organic matter. And, it, and taking into account that in various places, in various sediment cores, we found uh, similar, similar radiocarbon values. It's, it's quite likely that it is. Uh, there is a, a new study which is ongoing uh, in, in, uh, in collaboration with colleagues from uh, Bremen and uh, uh, we tr what we tried was not only to analyze the organic matter in terms of radiocarbon in, in total, but we also split it in several fractions. So in, in, it is the approach we tried and it, right now this is the same approach is, is tested in, in, the, in the Siberia uh, so, but it, it is uh, ongoing work. So, uh, I would be careful uh, with providing you, you a very specific answer. Uh, the, the only answer I can give you right now for sure is that with all this kind of markers, biomarkers also, we need to be careful if we analyze such a complex system. And it is something which we commonly miss not only in terms of organic carbon, in terms of many other uh, proxies. Uh, and uh, it's, it's also a case of Svalbard. We got a fantastic studies also related to um, ion and role of ion and other uh, metals and compounds also in biological cycles. Uh, and also with a calculation of fluxes and rates, while when you go into the details, it appears, for instance, that the authors apply sediment accumulation rate for the, from a sediment core just taken a couple of years earlier from another site. And uh, well, so there's a lot of effort into details, but then if we come to quantitative approach, we miss some basic things. Okay. So it's great. Thank you, uh, Victor. I'm pretty sure you and Tom have a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so we have uh, the last question if uh, Jin Peng. Jin Peng, are you from Guangzhou, right? Guangzhou, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello, Professor uh, Shushinsky. Very great work. My question also uh, relates to the uh, carb TOC, the carbon source. In the map, uh, the distribution of TOC in the project is uh, clearly divided to three sections. Um, heat of fortress, outside of fortress, and the middle of fortress. Um, in the heat of fortress and outside of fortress, the atheosis uh, content is uh, quite high. It's correct. So, uh, there have, does there have more information about the uh, reasons why it's, uh, why, yeah, this map show. Uh, what is the gap? What's the difference of these two uh, higher uh, TLC content uh, sections? I mean, the source. Again, uh, Again nice to see yes. you and thank you for the question. Uh, and, and you are expert in Polish, as really my surname is Szczuciński. Uh, uh, coming back to, uh, uh, to, 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 to the map, uh, it is geology which which plays a major role please remember that of course organic carbon uh, from uh, from uh, primary production is of, Im is of importance however we got uh, major sediment source not only from the fjord head here but we got also a number of of glaciers um, uh, it's, uh, on on both sides and taking into account the geology of a of this region, you may see that there are belts of various rocks around. And in the middle part, it is uh, uh, the middle part of a Hornsund Fjord, the dominating uh, sediment, uh, dominating rock types are carbonates. Mm -hmm. So they will not provide much uh, total uh, organic carbon in, which we would record in, in the sediment. So uh, if we, uh, if we focus on organic carbon, which is delivered f 
from the uh, rocks which are in the catchment, then we can at least in the at least in the inner parts we can explain quite a lot of variability. Uh, you may see also the case from Kongsfjorden here, where we got decrease with the distance from the glacier, and this decrease is. Uh, well correlated with uh, also decrease in uh, accumulation rate and also with uh, increase in primary production. Mm -hmm. uh, in Kongsfjorden, the source sediment are so-called red beds, Devonian sandstones, desertic sandstones, which are very poor in organic carbon. So then mm -hmm. also the total organic carbon content is, is much lower. Okay. Uh, that's yeah, great. We have two more two more talks. Uh, I think there's the one talk from our YouTube uh, live broadcast channel uh, from uh, Valentin uh, Zuchit, and she said a great presentation. Do you see any impact of the change in rate of ice stake rebound on this dynamic fluid and its infill? Do you see any that kind of uh, rebounding or particularly in the last uh, 50 years, the rapid retreat of the glacial. Anybody have a GPS monit monitoring? It's, it's, it's another very good question and a uh, question we used to, uh, to ask. And uh, um, the Little Ice Age ended just 100, 120 years ago. And since then we got a really large uh, loss of, uh, of ice mass on, on over Svalbard. And in the case of Greenland, it's already enough to see at least this elastic rebound effect. In case of uh, Svalbard, at some coastlines, we have some evidences of potential, uh, uh, which, which could be related potentially to that. However, the change of the mass, change of the thickness of the, of the glaciers is much, much smaller than in case of Greenland. So also this, effects in elastic rebound related to glacier isostasy is, uh, is much smaller. So it certainly must be taken into account and uh, it, must, uh, it, it will be for sure increasing with time as there is a kind of relaxation period for this, for this rebound. But so far there are very little uh, studies focused on that and no uh, it, it's not well proven that it, it, it really affects the modern coastlines. Okay, that's cool. And we also have a friend from Moscow, uh, Oscar, you know, uh, Eldina uh, Maka Hart Zunov. Oscar, thank you. A great talk. I'm wondering if there are repeated basimetry survey and how frequent they are. Can they assist in understanding the change of sediment supply uh, now or short term? considering the glacial retreat? Yes, for some areas, for instance, for uh, this part of uh, and Bre Poland, there are repeated surveys. Uh, this one is particularly interesting because of uh, one topic I haven't mentioned here. Some of the glaciers are from time to time also advancing, surging. And uh, in this repeated bathymetrical survey, too, uh, it, it was uh, nicely documented as well. Uh, however, in context of a question, probably more, it's more about measuring accumulation rate using this method. And it was done, for instance, in Kongsfjorden uh, and uh, accumulation rates in order of one meter per year were documented in this way, just in front of Tidewater Glacier. Uh, however, it's not common to do it. Uh, mainly because it's uh, pretty dangerous and it's not easy to work in front of the Tidewater Glacier. So most of the uh, um, sampling stations we did close to the glacier front, so we did it uh, already in autumn where glaciers are much less active and they are not calving uh, mm -hmm. anymore. Okay, cool. Okay, the last question. A couple of years ago in Nature, the Journal of Nature, there's some discussion. They said a fluid could be a, so a big or carbon storage, soaking up of the carbon. This is the title. But in my opinion, those carbon, like you mentioned, mainly is just a phys physically relocation. 
used to be maybe exposed online, but now moving in, inside of the food. And maybe could we become a big source, you know, to release CO2 instead of storage of the, you know, uh, greenhouse gas. What's your opinion? Uh, there are several sources of, of carbon, as we know right now, there is also a form of gas. Um, actually, and in 2015, uh, just shortly before publications of uh, a paper in Nature Geosciences about the uh, role of fjords in, uh, in the carbon storage, I got a, uh, I got a grant, uh, uh, I, I got funded a grant focused just on this topic. So, I, I was a little bit disappointed, but I was not the first one. <laughs> but later on, I found it a, a really, to, to be really great to, to, to find my, my research to be in the main one, one of the uh, uh, topics which are of common interest. Oh. Uh, and at that time, my arg arguments were like that. We got increasing sediment accumulation, right? Yeah. Uh, in the sediment, there is also organic carbon. And if we've got increase in sediment accumulation rate, then the preservation of organic carbon of marine origin is even better because it's covered with a sediment pretty fast. So it's not rework, it's not recycled or not so efficiently. So even if uh, most of the carbon which we discuss about is from, uh, is just a ready position from older rocks to the sediment, they may be still increase in efficiency of uh, burial in organic carbon. However, yeah. to assess it, uh, we need really to have a good quantitative approach because it's, it may be just like five, 10, 15 percent. Yeah. You know, before it's covered by ice, but now it's kind of covered, you know, uh, uh, preserved by the marine sediment, by the water. But the, that transport process, there's a bigger uh, uh, re process. I mean, the, the burning process, how much the organic carbon tend to in organic carbon, how to quantity. I mean, that definitely there's an interesting, you know, need to, I guess, Tom and many other people when you found out, I mean, because- it's, it's one of our topics of research when I mentioned this frac fractionation of uh, organic carbon, because yeah. some part of this old organic carbon is uh, refractory and it's, it's really a little use of it for, for biota. Yeah. So um, some uh, microbiological reactions may take place uh, on this, but in, in many cases it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's useless for biological processes, but there is a portion which, which, can, be, which can be really used. And uh, it's still an open question that I, I'm sure that during the following couple of years, there will be uh, a number of studies published on this topic. Okay, cool. So, uh, so oh gosh, almost 10.30 here in Sorry. the you know, East of the US. But anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. Thank you for the audience still, still stay here. I think it, it, you know, we, we can have more dialogue. And now I'm preparing the, a proposal to submit to the, about the green light, about the sediment and the organic carbon in wild food. This is definitely a good, good lecture for me. <laughs> so I will talk to talk, you and talk to Tom later, okay? And okay. So, Thank you very much for all the questions and for, for the discussion. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, hold on, that's the way. Okay, I have one more, one more thing. Uh, one, one more thing, you know, uh, uh, please go ahead to come in. Oh, that's not, that's, that's not what well, I want to show. And I uh, want to show my PowerPoint. So please coming, coming back, um, you know, this uh, Friday. And also in whole February, February we have a, a bunch of good speak, a good talk already lined up. Dino uh, Delft and uh, Kevin, uh, from in Colorado, talk about you can read uh, Tom, you know, is ready to talk about all the similarly the food. And uh, so now Delta Lebu and uh, Neil Brer also talk about that organic carbon and the Xixi, you know, from Singapore. And he will talk about some uh, high mountains river. So the whole family is great. Please mark your calendar every Wednesday, every Friday. 
9 a.m. U.S. East Coast time. So same time. So I see you this Friday and next week. Okay, great. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye.